So let's take our first example. Imagine we have two strata. The first strata is 5 meters thick and has a unit weight equal to 20 kilonewtons per meter cubed. This overlies a second strata which is 6 meters thick and has a unit weight of 15 kilonewtons per meter cubed. And let's say, for some reason, we're interested in finding the effective stress at the bottom of the second strata. We start by calculating the total stress at the bottom of strata 2. And you can think of this as being asked to lift all of the soil above this depth. So therefore, we have to lift strata 1, which is equal to the unit weight of 20 multiplied by the depth of 5 meters. And we add to this strata 2, which is 15 kilonewtons per meter cubed multiplied by 6. Adding these together, we get 190. And checking our units, we find that we have kilonewtons per meter cubed multiplied by meters. Meter above the line cancels with one of the meters below the line, and this gives us 190 kilonewtons per meter squared, or kilopascals. Similarly, the stress due to water, U, is equal to the unit weight of water times the height of water. And as there's no water in this case, U is just equal to zero. Hence, the effective stress is equal to the total stress minus the pore water pressure, or 190 minus zero, which is equal to 190 kPa. Easy. So let's do another example, but this time include the water table. Starting again with the same problem, but this time having a water table present here. We know already that the presence of water in the void space increases the soil's unit weight. So let's say the unit weight of strata 2 now becomes 16 kilonewtons per meter cubed. Starting again with the total stress, we have to lift all of the soil above the location of interest which is the bottom of strata 2 in this case. For strata 1, we've got 20 kilonewtons per meter cubed times 5 meters, plus 16 times 6 for strata 2, giving a total stress of 196 kPa. This can be represented graphically as follows. Now we must deal with the water. We've already taken its weight into account via the increase in unit weight of strata 2. But the water has a second influence. As it fills the void spaces, it develops a hydrostatic pressure equal to the unit weight of water times the height of water. This is an important finding. It only takes the filling of the tiny void spaces to develop full hydrostatic pressure. The height of water is thus a critical measurement and is often determined by recording the depth of water in a standpipe. So, taking the unit weight of water to be 10 kilonewtons per meter cubed, the hydrostatic or pore water pressure, U, is equal to 10 multiplied by 6 or 60 kPa. This can also be shown graphically. We now have our total stress and pore water pressure and subtracting these, we get an effective stress of 136 kPa. The resulting effective stress profile looks like this. Very good. Let's do another example. In our next example, let's say the water table rises to ground level due to a period of prolonged rainfall. With the influx of rainfall, this will increase the unit weight of the soil in strata 1. Let's assume it increases to 20.5 kilonewtons per meter cubed. So starting with the total stress, we have for strata 1, 20.5 kilonewtons per meter cubed multiplied by 5, plus for strata 2, 16 kilonewtons per meter cubed multiplied by 6 meters, giving a total of 198.5 kilopascals. And the pore water pressure, U, 
is equal to 10 kilonewtons per meter cubed multiplied by 11 meters or 110 kilopascals. Subtracting these gives us an effective stress equal to 88.5 kilopascals. Notice an interesting feature here. In the last two examples, the presence of water has reduced the effective stress. Taking this one step further, engineers are often required to design structures underwater. Let's see how such problems are dealt with. Continuing with example 3, let's say a 2 meter deep river runs over the ground surface and we need the effective stress here. Total stress then is equal to 10 multiplied by 2 meters, the effect of the river, plus what we had before, strata 1, 20.5 multiplied by 5, plus strata 2, 16 multiplied by 6. This gives a total stress equal to 218.5 kilopascals. The pore water pressure in this case is equal to 10 multiplied by the depth of water, 13 meters, giving a result of 130 kilopascals. Subtracting these gives us our effective stress, which turns out to be 88.5 kilopascals. Wow, no change. What does this tell us? Let's see. So we have the total stress increasing by, it, by an amount equal to the depth of the river multiplied by the unit weight of water. But at the same time, the pore water pressure increases by the same amount. Thus, they cancel each other out. And this holds true for any depth of water above ground level. Try it yourself. For example, rework problem 3 for the middle of an ocean having a depth of a thousand meters of water. You'll find we get the same result. Let's do one final example. Moving back to terra firma this time, a wide road embankment, four meters high, is to be constructed over our soil profile given in example two. The setup looks like this for an embankment material having a unit weight of 20 kilonewtons per meter cubed. So our total stress now becomes 20 multiplied by 4, the embankment, plus 20 multiplied by 5, strata 1, plus 16 multiplied by 6, strata 2, giving a total of 276 kPa. And our pore water pressure remains as 6 multiplied by 10, or 60 kilopascals. Subtracting these, gives us an effective stress here of 216 kPa. Note in this example we emphasise that the loading was over a wide area as it resulted in a uniform stress increase with depth. However, with narrow foundations the increase in stress attenuates with depth due to the two or three dimensional spreading of load. This however is a topic for another day. So to conclude these problems have illustrated how we calculate effective stresses when stationary water is present. Join us in our next video where we will explore how moving water impacts on effective stresses.